Today we begin our celebration of Advent. On these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we will rejoice in the great gift that is ours in Jesus Christ. To help us celebrate, we will be lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. The candles signify that Jesus is the light of the world. The evergreens remind us that he is life and brings life to us. All these things are arranged in a circle because life in Christ has no end. Each Sunday we will light an additional candle. Then on Christmas Eve we will light all the candles, including the center one, the Christ candle. As we do, we shall rejoice that Christ has come to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. that God will finish all he has started. Hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised. All promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope today and forever. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift.
lesson is from the Prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 2, and the first few verses. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And then we're going to continue with our Readings from Romans that we've been doing this fall, and that's chapter 13. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And may these words of scripture guide our hearts, our lives, and our minds. Um, 
uh, a bent, stretch, and breathe uh, continues to happen in the back of the church here, called the... The vestry? The vestry, not the sacristy, the vestry. There's some terminology here I'm still getting a handle on. And uh, we partly decorated the place on Friday night and uh, had some music and some candles. It was a very nice atmosphere for practicing this combination of uh, conscious movement, uh, Tai Chi, a little yoga, a little bit of everything, and some Christian scriptures on top of that. Um, so do join us some evening and see if you can keep up. Um, <coughs> some people find it a little easier than others. And it's quite all right if you just come to bend, stretch, and breathe, and that's all you do. Okay, you bend a little and breathe a little and just sit or lie, and that's also quite fun. And also, thanks to everyone who came here and, and decorated the church. It looks fabulous, um, and we had a lot of fun. And uh, Carol played the piano to, to keep things moving along, so we have a nice-looking sanctuary. Um, <coughs> I will be following the lectionary now through uh, Christmas and beyond, so in a way I do not get to choose the topics, but whoever chooses this lectionary, it's a committee of people in, uh, I don't know where, I don't know who chooses the lectionary, but somebody does. And um, almost all Protestant churches follow it, and the Catholics follow it <clears throat> for the most part, some slight variations. Um, I think a committee of people must meet someplace, and they, they choose the lectionary for, for years, for years in advance, so I don't get to choose the topic. But if there's a topic you would like addressed, if there's a burning theological issue or any kind of an issue you've got going and you'd like to see how the Bible addresses this, well, by all means, ask. I love um, deep, probing, philosophical uh, questions and uh, love to do research on them, and I'd be happy to come up with a, a ready-made sermon for any burning topic that faces this congregation. I just can't guarantee that I'll address it uh, immediately. It might take a couple of weeks or even a couple of months before it percolates through the lectionary and through me and so on. And likewise, <coughs> yeah, you've noticed we have lay readers on, of, of a Sunday morning. If you would like to be one of these people, um, please let me know. Um, the lay readers so far have been chosen by a, a random process of election um, that is really as inscrutable as the election of the Calvinist deity. Um, so anyone could do it, really, just by volunteering. Uh, I assure you, um, people have not been chosen for this job on the basis of merit or anything like that. So that means anyone, really, anyone can do it who can read. And I presume that includes all of you. Um, and finally, the last announcement. If there's something that uh, you want me to do, um, <clears throat> don't hesitate to ask. And then don't hesitate to repeat yourself. Okay? <laughs> Do not hesitate to, re to remind me, okay? <clears throat> um, there are essays about, uh, um, well, one of my favorite essays, this is a, a diversion. One of my favorite essays is called Why Smart People Can't Learn. Okay, you could think about how this might apply to me. The reason smart people can't learn is because they think they know everything already. You know? They're already full, so it takes it takes a while to get new uh, tricks out of a smart person. And of course, all of us in this congregation are very smart. Um, <clears throat> now, today is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, I find that um, once you accept that this dark, um, cold time of year has indeed arrived, um, and that it's not going away anytime soon, <clears throat> uh, then you can begin to enjoy it. Um, I think acceptance of the inevitable is one of the greatest virtues that we can cultivate. Uh, so Advent is a time to cherish friendships, uh, to read some good books, to send Christmas cards, maybe even the old-fashioned way by the U.S. mail, uh, to invite friends over for food and drink and enjoy human society. Um, this time of year, there are two notable, well, three notable events. I want to talk about uh, in this uh, that happened 
this week in history. Um, Andrew Carnegie <coughs> was born in Scotland this time of year, November 25th, 1835. He made a lot of money in the steel industry, <coughs> and then he gave much of it away. Now, most of us know that he founded a lot of libraries. Hundreds and hundreds of libraries were funded by Andrew Carnegie. But he also gave away a lot of money for church organs. So that, and this is a direct quote from Andrew Carnegie, so that beautiful music would lessen the pain of the sermons. <laughs> The American Heritage Dictionary, you can look this up, gives two definitions of the word preach. Okay? Preach. One, to deliver a sermon. Okay? Two, to give religious or moral instruction, especially in a drawn out, tiresome manner. <laughs> now that's the dictionary. I'm not making this up. <laughs> All I could say is that I do my best to make sure that my utterances here on Sunday uh, morning match definition number one <laughs> and not definition number two. Uh, if I fail, let me know. Um, also, um, this time of year, uh, the birthday of Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, November 26, 1922. He proposed to a red-haired gal when, he, when they were both very young. So you see this red-haired girl thing he had going in the strip? That's very autobiographical. And Charlie Brown, Charles Schultz, okay, he was an awkward, introverted kid. Uh, she turned him down. And shortly he moved west out to Santa Rosa, California, and uh, married, raised a family, led a very pleasant life and his children are still active in uh, civic life in Santa Rosa, California. Um, Santa Rosa is a very nice small city, 200,000 people, 60, 70 miles north of San Francisco. Um, if you go there, you will see four foot high statues of Peanuts characters all over town. In every shopping center, in front of civic buildings, there you will find Snoopy or Lucy or Charlie, and it's really kind of it's wonderfully fun and whimsical to have these statues all over town. Uh, he gave away a lot of money to local charities <coughs> and to the Sonoma County Regional Airport, which is named, yes, Charles M. Schultz Sonoma County Airport. And yes, there are statues of Peanuts characters all over the airport. And the information desk looks exactly like Lucy Van Pelt's psychiatry. <laughs> Now, on a more serious note, in history, this time of year, 75 years ago, the German army was on the outskirts of Moscow. It looked like the city would fall and the government have to flee, but the temperature dropped suddenly. The snow began to fall, and the German army discovered that they had not brought the right kind of motor oil. So all their motor vehicles ground to a halt, or they couldn't turn them off, okay? So they kept running gasoline, burning up fuel, they started running out of fuel. The soldiers did not have winter gear, or camouflage gear for that matter, for fighting in the snow, and so they missed their chance for quick victory. So there's some lessons here. Uh, Winterize your vehicle. <coughs> um, wear warm clothes. It's not a bad idea to have a sleeping bag in your vehicle in case of problems. And of course, everyone's got a cell phone now, so there is emergency help available. And um, some power bars in the, in the car. It's not a bad idea either. Now, for my brief and hopefully not too tiresome sermon today, I'll develop what I last said, uh, what I said last week about justice uh, at all. The Bible is concerned with many things and many issues. 
things the Bible is concerned about include especially, well, people, land, and water. And then concepts and issues that the Bible talks about a lot include justice, truth, uh, fairness, divinity, of course, salvation, redemption, promise, forgiveness, and many others. Now, you may, may remember that I spoke about the ethical dilemmas that we face as humans last week and raised the problem of how we can escape from what is often apparently an endless cycle of undue self-concern caused by our own selfishness and the selfishness of others. You see, if everyone on earth is being selfish all the time, this is going to create insoluble, insoluble conflict. So, <clears throat> how do we behave in an ethical manner? How do we get what we want and need out of life without hurting others, without being unfair? How do we know when we have our own fair share? And then, how do we stop when we have enough? <clears throat> Now, especially, how do we cooperate with our friends and neighbors, our fellow countrymen, <clears throat> in order to get the things we need without hurting others? For these ethical issues obviously multiply exponentially the more people are involved. We um, human beings have been around on this earth in our present form for a rather long time. <clears throat> it's at least 50,000 years since there has been substantial genetic change in our species. Um, sometimes you see a number of 150,000 years. That's a long time <clears throat> when we've been basically the same. And we think of the Bible as an old book, and of course it is. It's two to 3,000 years old. And there had already been a long history at that point, plenty of triumph and tragedy, plenty of war and peace and pestilence and plenty of problems caused by the selfishness and limited vision of individual human beings and the selfishness and limited vision of groups of human beings. And so the Bible records a lot of yearning for better times, for a better form of government or rule or someone who would be a better king than the ones who came before. If you read about the kings of the Old Testament, uh, you find that the writers of the Bible um, complain about them a lot. Mm -hmm. Biblical authors did not like very many of them and absolutely despised a lot of them, and for good reason. They weren't very good people, and the prophet Samuel, uh, in his book, uh, includes a long complaint about kings, um, which I'll read some other time. <clears throat> but trust me, the kings of the Bible were a nasty lot, for the most part, with a few notable exceptions. So eventually we get this prophecy from Isaiah. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Now we've heard this um, phrase, one of the most uh, famous in the Bible, beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. That comes where it does. Um, in other words, there's, the prophet says, at some future time, people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. There will be no conflict because the Messiah has come and he shall judge between nations and arbitrate for many peoples. We'll have a good, wise king to, raise, to reign over us and the good king will give just orders and we'll all obey him. So problem solved. We don't need to use our implements of war. We'll, uh, we could fire all the conflict resolution experts. Uh, the lawyers will all go out of business and everything will be fine. Um, and we Christians now, we believe that this messianic king prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah et al. has come, 
the very Messiah talked about by Isaiah and the other prophets. But the Messiah does not seem to quite reign um, in this particular fashion. It's been 2,000 years now, we look around. We could say that as far as we can tell, God is not issuing clear orders about our behavior. Or at any rate, these clear orders are being routinely uh, disobeyed. And so, this international disarmament, swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, all that nice stuff, that has not happened yet. So what's going on? Does God reign? Or does God not reign? Um, Mm, do you see the problem? I hope so. Now, when you've painted yourself into a sermon corner like this, asking about whether God is active in history, or if so, how so, um, you have to call for assistance. You need to call upon one of the greats who has considered this matter of divine justice and divine action in history and human responsibility and the relationship amongst all these things. So today, uh, the, um, the special uh, assistant I'm calling upon is Abraham Lincoln, who established, you may remember, a national day of celebration uh, for Thanksgiving um, in 1863. So listen here to some paragraphs that he composed uh, in calling for a national celebration of Thanksgiving. <clears throat> it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the sure hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. We know that by His divine law, nations, like individuals, are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest of bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It has seemed to me fit and proper that God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. November 25th, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln. May the Lord add a blessing to these words of wisdom. Amen.
fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Go. Go.